Internet. Welcome to episode 323 of the Asota Calibers podcast, the second limited podcast. There's a little bit for everyone. I'm Weird Beard, and with me tonight, she's the greatest. She's amazing. She's also distractible, but she's the greatest hostess in the world, Erin Paulette. How you doing, Erin? Oh, I, I've had a headache literally all day. And, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but when I wake up and my head is hurting, that kind of puts a cloud over things. I'm mostly better. Um, it, it, it's kind of a, a, like a pain hangover at this point. The, the headache itself is gone. I'm just kind of hurting because I've hurt, which is fun. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking kind of fuzzy. And um, I, I got distracted because Weirdbeard asked me a D&D question. And it was like, ooh, let's find out. I can't find it. I know I saw it. I must find it. And uh, so I kind of lost track of how much time I went on that rabbit hole dive. And I'm convinced I saw it. I just don't know where. Um, so if if you are a, a D&D 3rd edition or 3.5 Grognard and you know where the spell Melf's Minute Meteors came from, let me know. Because I swear I saw it. But I can't find it. Not online, not in the spell compendium. It, it tasks me weird. It tasks me. I will just say, one of the reasons why I am here before all of you right now is because I absolutely love winding up the passions of other people. And it's one of those, like, I had a close friend in college who is into guns and cars, and that is literally where my interest of guns and cars comes from, is the this person likes to talk about cars. I want to learn about cars so I can talk about cars with you because I like it when you talk about cars. Because mm. you get excited. And, oh, you like to talk about guns. I want to learn about guns so you can talk. Teach me about guns because I like when you talk about guns because you're excited. So you're a fluffer. I mean, it's not the first time someone's called me. <laughs> I guess it's fitting. <sighs> uh, so uh, how are you doing, Fluffy Bunny Boy? Uh, I'm doing uh, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. We actually had... Uh, uh, just, uh, just, just last night we had, uh, Caleb Daniels on handgun radio. So, uh, keep your eyes peeled uh, for that one. Like Ryan was just like, Oh my God, thank you for setting this up. He did such a good job. Yeah. Cause <laughs> Ryan, Ryan, Ryan is just as big a James Bond fan as I am. So it was, uh, it was a good time. We had, uh, we, we all sent David along for the ride. So it was, uh, there was, there, there was, there was much bond love on handgun radio. Uh, so that was a uh, that was a good time, and uh, we got a good show lined I up. I guess, I guess you could say it was a James Bonding experience. There, heck, huh? there actually was a uh, was a podcast. I don't think it's around anymore, but uh, called James, the James Bonding Podcast, and it was it was Matt Myra. I forget who the other person was, but yeah, they they and they were reviewing bond movies and they were reviewing it from both sides so every time a new bond movie came out they would review that movie and then um and then they would go back as far back to go through so they started off with like i think it was like casino royale and the and doctor no were like the first two episodes mm. so what happens when they ran out of movies I think they ran out of podcasts before they ran out of movies because it was on the Nerdist Network, which is no longer a thing. Mm, okay. And I could look it up, but then that'd be just the rude thing of looking crap up in the middle of a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. <laughs> but the good news for you is I'm like the ultimate smokescreen because I'm just going to talk. <laughs> and while I'm talking, the quiet one does is is, is devising a plan. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why that one time I tried to do a podcast without you, it was like, oh, wow, there, there's a, a lot of quietness here. Huh. Imagine that. Yeah, I've been to, doing podcasts for like roughly 15 years, and I've never done one alone. Closest I've get is the weird audio thing. And they're very short because, oh, my God. 
I mean, it was just, you know, I introduced a segment. I got to the point. I was done in a minute or two. Huh. This should probably go on for longer. I don't really want to pat it out. I don't know what to say. This is normally where weird blathers for a bit. Okay. I've just learned something about myself. I shouldn't do podcasts solo. Moving on. <laughs> yeah, my 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 dad was our uh, was our high school uh, tennis coach, and his favorite thing to do was to put some of like the top varsity people up against some of like the the, the lowest players because crazy stuff would happen. Because if you got somebody that hits the ball really really hard but suddenly they're going up against someone who really doesn't have a lot of arm strength and they're just kind of cream puffing the ball over the net. You get tired so fast because it's all you. <laughs> it, it, it's very much that. Is the No, no, no. I need someone to hit it back to me hard so that I can hit it back harder. <laughs> so how have you been, Aaron? Um, well, uh, other than the headache today, um, I've been all right for the past week. Um, just still busy, and this week is going to be busy, um, because in addition to the normal stuff I do, it's going to be, you know, uh, Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. and then Friday, where everyone else is shopping, that's when uh, my family traditionally puts up Christmas decorations, and that's always fun, because usually, um, so this year for example we've had a lovely cold front come in and it's been in the 60s and it's dropped down to like uh, the low 40s high 30s at night wonderful fantastic but I, I will wager a fair amount of money that on friday when it's time to put the lights up on the roof it's gonna be sunny and 80 <sighs> so because you know florida and uh, I'm I'm not really looking forward to that. We thankfully don't do the the out, outside outside decoration. And uh, what's really been working out nicely is for the last eh, about four or five years now that my daughter is bigger. It involves me going up into the attic and pulling down all the stuff and lugging all the stuff down the stairs and stacking them up in the living room. And then I go downstairs and edit a podcast while I hear Christmas music coming from coming through, coming through the floor. And, and, and I come up later and, and, and the tree is up and, uh, and it's decorated and hopefully mm. the Christmas music has died down because, uh, there, there isn't really that many good Christmas songs. Mm. So for me, really, the best thing about Black Friday, because we don't go shopping because I hate crowds and we're doing the Christmas decorations. But um, after we're all hot and sweaty and tired and we want something cold to eat uh, for lunch, we have turkey salad sandwiches, mm. which is exactly what you think it is. We, we take the parts of the Thanksgiving turkey and we do it up like chicken salad, only it's turkey. And it is really tasty. I love, I love, I love turkey in general. Like, there's people that hate it. No, I absolutely love, in love with the stuff. And yeah, and I, I, I go, I go pretty wild with my chicken salads. My, my, my personal favorite is I do like the, you know, the, the diced onion, diced celery, and all that. But I also like to add curry powder, uh, curry powder to the mayo. And uh, I dice up uh, raisins. Usually, the golden ones actually are better are better than the standard brown ones, and uh, and, and uh, some pecans. And that's uh, that makes a pretty bang banging sound. And it's better better with turkey than it is with chicken. Mm. But all right, well, shall we shall we get into some news? Sure. How are we going to segue this? Um, I just did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, say, and, and this is this 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 was one that you uh, that that you threw to me, so I'll, I'll I'll let you start start off with it. Oh, great! Okay, so I've I've got to kind of bring myself down here because this is a serious topic, and we we were just BSing back and forth here. Um, so the the headline here is suspect in custody after unprovoked New York City stabbing spree leaves three people dead, and this is a tragedy because all spree killings and mass murders and actually all, all murders 
in general, are tragedies. But the reason that I wanted to bring this up is because of the Second Amendment. And, you know, New York City has these really restrictive gun laws that, despite uh, the Bruin decision, New York City is still fighting. They're digging in their heels and saying, no, it doesn't apply to us. And so they've got these rules to make people safe, and yet these rules did nothing to stop a... You know, I'm just going to go with sick. I don't know if if mentally ill or not, but if someone just decides to kill people for no reason, th- there's a sickness there. And so he killed uh, two men and critically wounded a woman who then later on died. So he murdered three people for no apparent reason whatsoever. And he's been identified as a homeless man with eight arrests. And he was just using kitchen knives. He had two of them. And and he stabbed people to death. So why are we talking about this on a Second Amendment podcast? Well, think to Merry Old England, where they have all of their gun laws. And it's practically impossible to own a pistol. And it's very, very difficult to own a sporting firearm. And... I haven't heard about it recently, but you know, in in the in the tens and the the teens, I heard a lot about how there were all sorts of knife attacks in Great Britain, and then you had the the the, the knife surrender bins mm-hmm. and the big um, campaign, you know, only cowards carry knives and things like that. And and you would see the police with their, you know, junk on the bunk photograph. And some of them would be like, okay, that's a pair of scissors. Okay, that's a screwdriver. And the point being is you restrict guns. It does not restrict murder. It simply restricts the tools and you're still going to have murder. And now, as a result of the, the knife laws and the knife confiscations, first of all, you have to be like an adult in order to buy bread knives at a supermarket, which is ridiculous. But then there was a pivot to acid attacks, where people would throw various uh, acidic or caustic cleaning compounds at people's faces, and people were blinded and mutilated. And I'm... Really, the only surprise I have here is that why hasn't this happened sooner? Why am I not hearing about it more often in New York? And this probably does happen a lot more often. It's just this was an unusual spree done by an unusual perpetrator, and that's why we're hearing about it. But don't let people say, oh, all we have to do is ban guns and murders will magically disappear. Because this is just one more point of evidence against that very, very wrong argument. Yeah, abs- absolutely. And this is, I mean, it, you you mentioned yeah, mental illness. Yeah, most people don't kill anybody. You know, may have difficulty killing someone who needs killing, who is actually a, a physical danger to the, them or others, and all that. And this guy is literally killing total strangers. Like, there's there's something going on here that's that's very very severe. And yeah, this is this was New York. So guess what? This guy's wandering around, stabbing people and menacing people, and absolutely. Nobody until the police showed up intervened because they couldn't, because not only can you pretty much not carry a firearm in New York, you also can't carry a pocket knife or a baton or anything like that. So this guy with, and again, these are what appear to be two eight inch chef knives of the like blister pack at your grocery store level of quality there's just a little you know pressed in you know thermoplastic handles and all that this is not this is not like bowie knives or anything designed for fighting or murder or commando use or all this cutco knives yeah yeah this is the these are actually (laughs) 
It pains me to say because I used to work for Cutco and I have nothing good to say for them. These are even worse than the Cutco Cutco chef knives that, that I used to sell. And those are not very good. Uh, so yeah, these are, this, it, this is not, you know, serious weaponry, but Hey, guess what? Once you have banned all the serious weaponry, guess what? The cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs guy with $8 worth of worth of cheap chef knives is suddenly now a spree killer. And so, yeah, this is just, you're never going to put the genie back in the bottle. Let the good people carry weapons. That's my, that's my take on that. I agree. All right. Now moving on, this is, you know, this is actually, I, I saw this story and, and said, Oh, this is definitely something good for it. And as I'm reading it, I'm like, Oh wow, this has got, uh, this has got quite the kind of personal connection on my level because it is a, uh, um, um, a, 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 a Boston woman, uh, was uh, flying from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, which is uh, I'm, I, I have friends in Charlotte, uh, and uh, uh, they were flying on on Delta. I will add just for this because the Delta has been a an anti gun company on, on many occasions. Uh, I don't know if the fact that Lucy McBath is a former Delta employee uh, adds into it or if it's just the fact that they're based out of Atlanta and that's just generally the climate there. Uh, that name is familiar to me, but I can't place it. Who's Lucy McBath? She is the former director for uh, for every town, and now she is a I believe congresswoman from Georgia. Mm. Okay. And her her son was uh, Jordan Davis and was killed by the the man who went over to the kids and told them to turn down their music. I don't know what's said, but I have some speculations on what was said. And he then went back to his car, pulled out the gun emptied into the the car the kids drove away uh jordan D- jordan davis uh, was fatally shot and uh the guy went back to the hotel room had a few drinks ate a pizza went to bed woke up the next morning drove home by that time the police had had found seen his license plate uh in the security camera footage and tracked him down and he then made up a story about there being a shotgun in the or he's seeing a shotgun in the van and that's why he's dead he- shot and yeah, I, I vaguely remember something about how he was in fear for his life, and yet he calmly went back to his hotel room, ate a pizza, slept, and then it was only later that he called the police, probably because nope. he heard he never, they wanted he never him. ever called the police. The police knocked on his door, and then oh, he had the whole story. Okay, and I, 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 I go to oh, go to actually all that length of that story because why would a grown man think that he can just fill a van full of nine millimeter bullets and then just go about his day in the state of Florida. And, uh, and I will, uh, and I will note that the only people that are saying that that is something that you can do are the anti-gun people trying to change the laws and just saying anti-gun people, you are teaching people absolutely. You're teaching people that, that they can murder. You're emboldening people. Oh, yeah, that, that's right up there with the claim that as long as you shout you're in fear for your life, you can shoot in self-defense and it'll all be fine. Yeah, the old South Park, it's coming right for us. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, but so she was she was flying from Charlotte to uh, to to uh, to Boston uh, in uh, uh, on, on a Delta Airlines flight and uh, she had some uh, some guns. And do they specifically say? It appears to be that there's these some very very heavily modified Glocks in the uh, um, it it uh, in the in the, uh, the 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 embedded video that I actually didn't watch, um, and she say I I didn't see that 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 uh, they said what it was, but they did mention that they were heavily customized mm-hmm. and. The, they are four thousand dollars worth of guns. Yeah. So since there are two of them, we can assume that each one was two thousand dollars. Which, eh, you know, the last time I checked, a brand new Glock was, ooh, it was less than a thousand. Yeah. I, I, so I, I think I think probably. I mean, I've seen, it, I've definitely seen some inflated prices with like some some of the bidding wars and the shortage, but I think you can still get. Like a Glock, a Glock 19 or a Glock 17 out the door for, 
you know, roughly six hundred dollars. So yeah, that's what I was thinking too. So that's that's a lot of work done on these guns, and uh, you know, bless this lady. She says, and I kind of feel like some of this is a little white lie here, but I understand why she said it, which she says, I'm not so frustrated for the fact that I'm going to lose $4,000 worth of guns. And it's like, you are. I know you are, but I understand why you're saying it like that, because she's far more concerned that, uh, you know, now that these guns have been stolen, there's the possibility someone's going to use them in a crime, someone may die, and so she now feels morally responsible because her guns were stolen. But I I have to say, no, honey, you're not. Because you locked them up. You transported them according to TSA standards. And when she got the gun case, the, the locks were gone. And she said it felt pretty light. And so she opened it up and they were gone. So I understand why she feels guilty. She'll, she'll never hear this podcast. But no, it wasn't your fault. It was the fault of someone at at Charlotte Douglas International, um, perhaps multiple someones, because um, so so Deviant Olam, um, who some of you may have heard of, uh, travels the country a lot. He flies a lot, and he flies with guns and he flies with other things, and he's got a documented history of. TSA cutting off the locks on his guns, even though they're not supposed to. And he's gotten to the point now where he has multiple locks that he, you know, he's got spare locks that he puts into the case. And so it's basically with a note that says, after you've cut my locks off and inspected my guns in violation of whatever, please lock it up with these new locks. So this is not a thing that is new. Um, This woman wasn't singled out because of who she was. Someone said, oh, hey, there's a gun, or this is a container that I can't open with my TSA lock. We're going to cut it open. And either the person who cut it open stole it, or they just went, yep, that's a gun, and then closed it back up, and then one of the baggage handlers stole it yeah i, li- I linked so, one of dv Olam's videos in the show notes so we've we, we, we we've we've got that for all that and, and he actually specifically has switched over to a brand of uh of lock uh that uh where it's very very easy f- to replace the shackle on it so that when he gets to his hotel room after they've cut the locks off of his gun case he could simply take the take take the take the locks apart and then and then throw away the, the the cut shackle and put in a fresh shackle, and so that he can instead of having to replace the entire lock, he can just essentially fi- repair repair the damage. But yeah, it's happening often enough. And one of the key factors that he always says is make sure that they open and inspect the uh, insp- you you open and inspect the gun uh, gun before it leaves your presence. And either either do it at the, you know with the with the gate agent that's going on with the with the declaration uh, form, or that you go with the TSA back to the inspection facility and let them inspect it in your presence, and that way you can unlock the case for them, let them do the inspection, and then lock everything back up, and away you go because. Essentially, that's the core of his problem is his case comes in. They can't open it because you're not supposed to use TSA locks. You're not that like that's one of the, the rules. You're supposed to use a TSA lock on your luggage with the exception of if you're having guns on it. And actually so much that actually I, I've heard of people who buy, you know, flare pistols and starter pistols uh, mm-hmm. to, and literally check a firearm that isn't even a firearm in their luggage so that they can, so that they can have TSA proof locks. So the TSA. Yeah. Like, like 10, 15 years ago, that was the advice. If you traveled with a really expensive equipment, like camera equipment, get this, you know, stupid starter pistol. Don't even carry the ammo, 
but throw it into the case and then check it as a firearm, and that would keep your very expensive camera or whatever equipment safe from pilfering. And that worked for a while, but it doesn't work anymore. And so, yeah, this is, I suspect, because these were heavily modified um, modified guns uh, and were super duper nice, somebody who was a gun nut got their eyes on this case and went, oh boy, this is good stuff. I've de- definitely heard stories of of someone, you know, was in a uh, was in a defensive shooting, and it happened to be that there or was involved in a domestic, you know, was was, was had a restraining order. They were getting a divorce, and so their guns got ended up getting seized by the police until everything was sorted out, and then things get sorted out, and all of a sudden, oh. Don't know where the guns went. What do you mean mm-hmm. you don't know where the guns went? Yeah, it was in the evidence locker. Wasn't judge orders me to return it. We can't find them. Why? Because someone went. Ooh, this is nice, and it went home with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So either way, just you have to be careful when uh when 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 flying flying with your firearms, and then yeah, I hope something comes of this because uh, I'm gonna say it's. It sounds an awful lot like this was TSA because I don't think the the baggage handlers were, are going to have much justification to cutting the locks off. Well, what I was thinking was the TSA cut the locks and then sent the case on its way, and then the baggage handler, oh, this looks like a gun case and it's unlocked. Mm-hmm. That's where I was going with that. Maybe, maybe. Uh, either way, <sighs> I I doubt we're going to get to the bottom of this, but. I, I, I oh, I I don't think it's ever going to be found. I would love for some accountability, but I I don't think so. Yeah, neither, and neither do I. and and like like the woman says, if you're going to be traveling with a gun, just drive. And I I have to agree. Now there may be times you can't drive. I mean, especially if it's like you know you're fl- f- traveling internationally. Like, you know, going up to a hunting expedition in Canada or whatever, um, driving across the country is super difficult. But yeah, that's one reason why I drive to Liberty Con, because I want to bring a gun with me and it's just easier than trying to fly with it. Mm-hmm. So overall, I've, I, I've, I've, I've flown with firearms many, many, many times and uh, <laughs> overall it's, it's okay. I've only had a few. I would like to point out that you were the very same person who very deliberately opts out from the scanner uh, in order to be patted down, and you make eye contact with the TSA guy the entire time in order to make it uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So when you say, oh, I travel with guns all the time and it's not a big deal, your level of of awkward is way different from mine i mean i i guess that is a uh a, a fair statement uh and all that and yes and by the way and, and anyone is welcome to use this my go-to line is one of the things that the tsa will ask you is do you have any sore sensitive areas on your body uh for the for the, for the pat down and i say only my fourth amendment <laughs> and if they ask for any clarification i note that I don't want to consent to this search. I'm not doing that. I just want to get on my flight. And I know that if I don't consent to this search, I'm not going to fly. So therefore, I'm under duress. But I am consenting to the search. Just know that it's always going to be under duress. <laughs> and then I make eye contact while, while they touch my jumbly bits. <laughs> uh, so if that one didn't make you mad, this one's going to make you mad. Uh, Yes. So this one, yeah, this is a story. The the uh, actually, um, I think it was Oddball posted this this morning. Uh, you know, supporting it was a Steve Lato video talking about this, and we we speculate that S- Steve possibly didn't watch the body cam footage of the arrest. And I I'm trying to remember if we talked about this in the past. I don't know if we have. I know we've we ab Oh, we absolutely did. We covered this. Okay. So, folks, this is about back in 2020, there was the ATF guy in Columbus who showed up at, at a woman's door demanding that she let him in so that he could something something about her husband's shotgun. And the police arrived and there was body cam footage of that. Now, 
the reason we're talking about this now is that there has been a trial and the ATF agent sued and he won uh, $1.6 million in damages uh, against the, um, yeah, it wasn't against the police department. It was against the two arresting officers. And, uh, you know, he sued because he got uh, his fifis hurt. And, you know, he claims that he can't do any field work and is now on permanent administrative duty. And then his his wife sued and some other things like that. And he claimed that the police were unprofessional. Now, I don't know what was seen at the trial and because I would think that maybe the jurors saw something we didn't because from what I can see of the body cam. So the first officer pulls up. And he, I don't remember quite what he said anymore. Um, I, I, I don't think he specifically said, put your hands up, although he may have. But it, it was very obvious that he was a police officer. He was approaching someone and he wasn't being commanding or rude and his gun wasn't out. But this ATF, mm, I'm going to call him a turd. The ATF turd, uh, whose name is James Burke. His literal response to the police officer rolling up, probably headlights, his response was, I'm a fudging federal agent. So he didn't cooperate. He responded to the police officer with profanity. And then the police officer escalated. He drew his gun, you know, told the guy, you know, put your hands up, get down on the ground. And Burke said, I'm not going to do it. I'm a federal agent. I'm not going to get down on the ground. Now, I don't know about you, but when someone has a gun drawn on me, I don't really care how morally right I am. I don't want to get shot. And so I'm going to get down on the ground. And the only time this guy complied was when a second officer pulled up and the guy was outgunned. And then they arrested him. And he resisted. And then, oh, uh, I don't remember what it was. It was something whiny like, oh, I've got diabetes. Oh, my chest. Oh, my whatever. And yet he was struggling against the cuffs. And, you know, you would think that a professional person would, you know, say, hey, I've got my identification. Um, you know, I'm going to cooperate. But... You know, if, if you will come over and check my identification, you will see that I am a federal agent and I'm just doing my job and you don't need to arrest me. And th there is a way this could have been done professionally. But no, he decided I'm with the ATF. I'm a fed. You're just a city cop. I'm not going to do what you want. So whatever the jury saw must have been really bad in order for them to rule in this guy's favor based on what we saw in the body cam footage. Um, there's a claim that footage was was released outside of official channels and it was done to to mock Burke and he needs to be mocked as far as I'm concerned. But um, essentially, I, I, the jury decided that the police were, were unprofessional and they decided to punish them. And Steve Leto mentioned in his and and I I, tr I trust Steve he's he's very thorough about uh, about these that one some evidence that was pre presented was internal emails from the department where they were laughing and joking about the fact that they had arrested this federal agent and that they had stuffed him in the back of the cruiser and har 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 um, and all that so I uh, that's that's the only thing I can think to imagine again the. The the bottom line is the cop rolls up. This this guy was completely plain clothes. He was just wearing regular old street clothes, you know, business casual attire. He was essentially trying to get his get his way into a woman's house for a gun that belonged to her husband, and her husband was not home. And he freaked her out enough that she shut the door, locked it, and then called the cops which is not what you do if you're trying to evade arrest or destroy evidence or all that. You don't call more cops. Um, yeah, not not just the police. She called 911. Yeah, yep, that's true. Yep, she she called 911. So cops are rolling up. And again, this is there's a whole bunch of lessons that also pertain to to you the the the, the average citizen. Uh 
and all that is we've talked about a million times winning winning the uh winning the race to 911 the person who calls 911 is the victim and the and, and all that until otherwise noted so when the cops rolled up they were they were keyed into this guy and uh so the cops ro- ro- rolled up on this guy they you know they challenge him i for- i forget the exact word, word words that he used and he essentially just cusses at them is super duper arrogant is super unprofessional which given that they're already being the he's he's already the subject of a uh, of a 911 call and he's acting like a dink like that's <laughs> That is definitely pulling anything into question. And then furthermore, then they say, put your hands on the ground. He starts reaching into his pocket, I assume, to get his wallet out to show the badge to the officer. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those, like, he's telling you to get down on the ground with his gun drawn, and now you're reaching into a pocket. This is is a good way to catch a bullet. Like, what is wrong with you? And, And then, yeah, it's... This is... It's such a weird case. Like, why would he be there plain closed... Why, why was there no backup? Why was there not an official vehicle? Like, it's just, mm-hmm. a, it, you know, why is he knocking on this person's house when the husband is not there? Why didn't he notify Columbus police that he would be doing this? Mm-hmm. Which he didn't. Yeah. And so that's why, despite his claims of a federal agent, even when they found his badge, they figured, this guy isn't acting like a fed. So maybe this is a forged um forged badge, forged yeah. papers, whatever. And so uh yeah, yeah, they didn't respect his authority because he wasn't acting like a proper federal agent would. Uh yeah, I I I 100% agree is one of those like he was like there's all sorts of ways that you could do this. And again, as a as as a uh as a private citizen, the if a cop is rolling up on you and they are in error, be polite, be respectful. And if the cop starts escalating, no matter how in the wrong they are, just comply and just do your best to document what you can uh, and, and all that. And your day to fight this will not be, you know, on the front lawn of somebody's, you know, of, of an apartment building. You know, your day, it'll be your day in court. So let them arrest you. Let them charge you. Let them let, let them search you. You know whatever they want to do that's wrong. That's that's more stuff you've got against them. You know in the future. But fighting with the officer and struggling with the officer and just refusing to comply and saying, "Oh no, you don't." C- cops will 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 ask you. Then they will tell you, and then they will make you. You're not. Mm-hmm. You're, and and they're going to call other guys. And to quote Ron White, I don't know how many of them it was going to take to kick my ass, but I knew how many they were going to use. So mm-hmm. just comply, get go 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 in that. Don't get any additional charges, you know, picked up because, like, even though, like, I mean, I guess you could argue that the if the arrest is deemed, you know, improper, then resisting it is resisting arrest doesn't work out. But it's. It's just a, everything he did was a bad idea. It was super unprofessional, and I will just say that, you know, in in a world where the Waco the, the Waco siege and Ruby Ridge happened, and now you know Brian and Malinowski, I'm going to straight up say was murdered by the ATF. I even wonder what the heck he was doing. Was he actually looking for a shotgun or? Was there more sinister ideas? The was he specifically targeting his house because her husband wasn't home? I'll just leave it at that. Um, mm-hmm. But I think what got the jury was probably the the laughing and the ridicule over it afterwards. Because I will say, Columbus police they weren't prof- they weren't professional either. They were definitely professional, you know, on the scene. Everything they did. I see no problem with on the you challenge somebody and then if they if they they're they're saying no I'm not going to lay down I'm not going to do that I'm going to start reaching into my pockets like that's that's not a way to make friends or influence people I I totally see how that went as far as south and it was entirely on this ATF agent but after that once you've got him in cuffs and once you got him in the back you you've won there's no need to gloat or all that and if you 
if you do if you do talk talk about it or laugh about that like don't don't do it so other people will notice definitely don't leave a paper trail mm-hmm. so yeah he's he's getting 1.6 million that's uh that's uh that's a that's a nice little settlement especially since i don't think he's really kind of wonder why he was why the why the why the money was so high cuz it's not like he was particularly injured i mean i guess it's one of those it's one of these punitive fines of the you're you're depriving somebody of their rights it was a wrongful arrest so we're going to we're going to make you feel it well i feel like he claimed some sort of you know workers comp type thing because he did yeah burke's attorneys claimed that he suffered lasting physical and mental injuries from the incident and was so injured from the encounter that he was unable to continue doing his job in an investigative and effective capacity he was ultimately moved from field work to a purely administrative and uh and support position so honestly this sounds to me like oh you rear-ended me whiplash Mm -hmm. I, I should probably be more forgiving, but I I really don't like ATF agents in general. And just just watch the video. Watch the video. You will see what an ass this guy was. I will uh, I will back your statement up a little bit in the fact that I, I, I and I've said this multiple times. I have I I, I have ta- I have talked to you know dozens of FFL holders and. If you're an FFL, especially when you first apply, you've got to meet with the ATF and then and then there's frequently, you know, audits and annual inspections and that sort of stuff that goes on. And I have never firsthand heard a story of, oh, my God, my ATF field agent that comes and inspects my FFL is is such a jerk, is such a prick. I I kind of I kind of suspect that those are the those are the gun nuts in the ATF, the guys that are there to to stop criminals and they like guns mm. and that's why they're they're in the ATF. Those are the guys that are doing the the audits and the inspections and that sort of stuff. And uh but the people that do the I'm going door to door, I'm going to knock on your door and ask to inspect your gun that is seemed that's that's seemingly uh illegal and all that. It seems like th- that's where the 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 guys that that were <laughs> that were in the Matthew Bracken novels tend to wind up. I agree. So, yeah, this is lessons to be learned. Don't be like this guy if you're in an encounter with the police. If 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 you think the police are in the wrong, voice it professionally and say I think you may be mistaken, officer. And if they say get down on the ground, the dude was on the a lawn. He could have found a nice soft patch of grass. He didn't even need to lay down on the sidewalk. Could have found a nice soft patch of glass and grass and just laid down, let them cuff him, say it's in my wallet. And if he was professional and they pulled out an ATF badge, guess what? They're going to believe it. But he was a prick. So when they pulled out an ATF badge, they're like, how do we know this is real? Because I thought they actually trained you to behave yourself in the ATF. Evidently not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's a uh, uh, that's that that's a that's a crazy story, and it's crazy that he won. But I I assume it's the if you're a police officer, you sh- he should have been he he should have been uh, professional. So should Columbus, and I guess that's where it cost them because I really don't didn't see anything excessive or untoward about this uh, about this encounter. Yeah, neither did I. On to our segments. On to our segments. All right. Well, this is very topical. We had talked about traveling with guns. And so David is here to talk about his experiences and his pro tips for traveling with guns. No, before you go. Hi, and welcome to Gun Lovers and Other Strangers. In this segment, I'd like to discuss being an informed gun owner when traveling to or through other states. At various times in mag dumps and blooper reels, we've talked about traveling with firearms, including the process of transporting a firearm by air, as well as different methods of storage during transport. In addition, I'm sure many of our listeners have heard my stories about traveling with my handgun collection when we moved from New York to Tennessee, and the saga of recovering my uncle's firearms from New York City. 
Back in episode 299, I went over the federal protections afforded travelers by the Firearm Owners Protection Act of 1986. I won't rehash all that here, but I do recommend listening to that segment again before bringing firearms on any out-of-state trips. One of the most important terms to remember when traveling with firearms is, know before you go. Simply put, we need to familiarize ourselves with the firearm laws of the states that we're traveling through as well as our destination. Two significant aspects of this specific to handgun carry licenses are recognition and reciprocity. These are terms I always try to bring up in firearms training, especially when I'm teaching a permit class. Reciprocity is a legal agreement between two states to accept each other's licenses, certifications, etc. This is pretty much how driver's licenses worked until the 1990s. Recognition simply means that state A will accept state B's license, certification, etc., even if state B chooses not to accept those from state A. For example, Tennessee recognizes every other state's handgun carry permit, even though somewhere around 15 states don't accept Tennessee's. There are some additional variables specific to handgun carry licenses. The most common is resident versus non-resident licenses. Certain states will accept a license from a resident of a state with a matching permit, but not if that permit is from a different state. For example, about a decade or so back, a Utah permit was the one to get for people who frequently travel to other states. Over 30 states accepted a Utah handgun carry license, and Utah made good money certifying instructors for classes and selling non-resident licenses. It became so popular that people who lived in more restrictive states would get a Utah non-resident permit and carry under that in their home state while struggling through the process to get a local license. In an attempt to put a stop to this, instead of liberalizing their own laws, some states put in a requirement that a carry license was only valid if it was from the carrier's home state or was a non-resident permit from the state in question. There are a number of websites and apps that make determining recognition and reciprocity easier. The next considerations to cover are the various types of state restrictions on possession and carry. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to leave NFA items like suppressors and short barrel rifles and shotguns out of this portion of the segment. The restrictions I'm talking about here can be broken down into three main categories. Magazine and ammunition bans, so-called assault weapon bans, and carry restrictions. Currently, 14 states and the District of Columbia have some form of magazine ban in place. These restrict legal magazine capacity to 10, 15, or 20 rounds. The last I've heard, New York's seven-round capacity ban is still on the books, but officials have stated that it will not be enforced and the legal maximum is 10 rounds. If traveling to one of these states, make sure all magazines comply with these capacity limits. Next are ammunition restrictions. In addition to federal restrictions on armor-piercing ammunition, several states have their own laws on this type of projectile. While most simply mirror the federal law, some are more restrictive. In addition, New Jersey famously has restrictions on possessing hollow-point ammunition for non-sporting or hunting purposes. A 10-round pistol magazine loaded with this type of defensive round would be 10 separate charges. In Massachusetts, it's illegal to possess ammunition or ammunition components without a state-issued owner ID card. Components include bullets, brass, powder, and primers. So bringing a bag of empty brass from out of state to a friend in Massachusetts who reloads is a crime. For hunters going to California, they have a variety of restrictions on lead projectiles. These are just three examples of state-level restrictions on ammunition. Once again, know before you go. At this time, 10 states and the District of Columbia have a so-called assault weapon ban. There are a similar number of lawsuits challenging these bans working their way through the courts. Hopefully, by next year, much of this segment will be outdated. These bans are generally based on some form of evil features test. In addition, some states also list specific firearms by manufacturer and model. For an example of what constitutes an assault weapon, I'll quote from current New York state law. Assault weapon means a semi-automatic rifle that has the ability to accept a detachable magazine and has at least one of the following characteristics. A folding or telescoping stock, a pistol grip that protrudes conspicuously beneath the action of the weapon, a thumb hole stock, a second hand grip or a protruding grip that can be held by the non-trigger hand, a bayonet mount, 
A flash suppressor, muzzle brake, muzzle compensator, or threaded barrel designed to accommodate a flash suppressor, muzzle brake, or muzzle compensator. A grenade launcher. Most of the other states with these types of bans have similar wording. The last type of restriction I'd like to discuss in this segment are ones that apply specifically to carry. These are commonly referred to as prohibited or sensitive location restrictions. In some states, such as my home state of Tennessee, precise signage is required to limit carry on private property. Others have more vague specifications for theirs. In addition, with some states, again including Tennessee, the signage is legally binding on the permit holder, while in others it isn't. At this time, I'm not sure if any states still have what are called vampire laws on the books. This is a particularly insidious type of private property restriction. It requires businesses to post a sign that carry is allowed on their premises. Yet again, know before you go. Finally, I'll close up with what's referred to as duty to inform. This has to do with any interactions a permit holder may have with a law enforcement officer. In some states, informing an officer is required by law. Even if this isn't the case, it's still considered a courtesy and good manners. Please, 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 whatever you do, never do this by telling them, I've got a gun. The interaction likely won't go well from there. The generally recommended option is something along the lines of, I have a handgun carry license and I do have a firearm on me, what would you like me to do? After that, please follow the officer's instructions. In my experience, as well as stories relayed from a number of other permit holders, the response is likely to be some variation of, you don't touch yours and I won't have to touch mine. So one last time, know before you go. Enjoy your trip and come home safely. Going to talk to you about sensitive places today, gun-free zones, or what really should be called liberal temper tantrums. That about wraps up this segment. If you have any questions for me or suggestions for future segments or a comment on a past segment, please post them on the Assorted Calibers podcast Facebook or MeWe pages and Aaron or Weird will make sure I see them. I'm also a contributor on the Blue Collar Prepping blog, which can be found at bluecollarprepping.blogspot.com. Finally, I'm a published author, and books with my stories can be found on Amazon under the names Brenna Bach and David Bach. That's all for now. Thanks for listening. I'm David, and this is Gun Lovers and Other Strangers. I gotta say, if you are traveling and, and in, in another area and you're with a group of people who aren't gun owners... Be very careful. Maybe if they're cool with the fact that they and they know that you're carrying, it might be a good idea to have a little conversation because people that aren't gun, gun owners see the world entirely different than people who are gun owners, specifically people who conceal carry, because they may suddenly go, hey, let's go. Let's go grab a bite to eat at this restaurant. And it's one of those like, oh, no, 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 that's a bar. It's illegal for me to carry in here. Hey, let's go. Let's 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 go check out this park. Oh no, that that park is uh, the the state says that state parks are restricted and you can't carry a firearm there. There's all sorts of you know minutia laws that again you may not know know that certain states do things differently as David points out, and then even then <laughs> your companions may also not know and may try to lead you into a felony with, uh, unbeknownst to them. <laughs> also another point i wanted to make is uh david notes that like some some states have uh lead, lead ammo bans for uh for environmental reasons and some states have uh armor piercing ammo ban usually given under the eye of uh officer safety uh you'll note that uh, oftentimes uh um ap ammo is defined by its construction namely that it's being led lead free you know people will say like the 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 green tip uh the green tip 556 ammo is is armor piercing even though it's not armor piercing but it's also has no lead in it and it's got some you know hardened you know some steel materials so it's a little bit better about barrier penetration but so sometimes it'll be considered armor uh, armor piercing but it's also lead free and so a lot of times it's kind of a catch 22 on the, oh, you can't carry this because it's got lead. It's environment. It's vi environmentally toxic and you can't carry that. That doesn't have lead because it's armor piercing. Haven't seen mm -hmm. it actually in effect, but uh, that's one of those like catch 22s that I think is uh, 
certain people may be planning to implement. Oh, I can absolutely see that happening. And I guess I have one last comment on uh, on this segment, and that's it. Kind of ties in with the with the ATF officer as like a good pro tip uh, for, uh, uh, for 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 everybody is that David mentions about you know how to how to not get how not not to make make a, a traffic stop go completely sideways because you have guns. I teach all my friends how I handle getting pulled over. Uh, whether I'm carrying or not, I do it the same way. And I say, do it because what I do is I turn on the dome light. I roll down my window and then I look in the rear view mirror and see if the officer is still in, in their car. If they are still in their car, then I will then dig through my glove box for my pertinent information, proof of insurance, that sort of stuff. And I keep, will keep an eye on the car. As soon as their door opens, my hands are at 10 or two on my wheel with on the wheel with the dome light open. And if I need to do anything, I like, if I need to reach for yes, for my registration, I'll say my registration is in the glove box. Uh, can I, uh, can I go reach for it and wait for them to give you permission? And by doing all that stuff, they're like, Oh, I'm not at all worried that this person digging through their glove box. Are they digging for their ins- proof of insurance or are they digging for a gun? Uh, it just works out really well. And if you do it, if you're not carrying a gun, still do it. Cause if a cop is put at ease, they may be more mm-hmm. lenient. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing that I do that was recommended to me by Masayub is that when I'm pulled over, even if I'm not carrying at the moment, I hand over my carry permit underneath my driver's license and so that's a very subtle way of saying that, you know, I may have a gun, but I'm letting you know, and I've been background checked, and I'm responsible, so you don't have to worry. Now, I'm not going to say that's gotten me out of tickets and just warnings, but I don't think that, uh, you know, someone has ever looked at that and then, oh, I'm going to write you a ticket. You know, they've never gone, you know... Well, I'm going to have to seize your gun for my safety or whatever. It, it. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it's never happened to me. Yeah, I, I, and I can certainly see Florida is different than Massachusetts. I think I might. Oh, definitely. You know, I think that might be just fine to hand over my Massachusetts carry permit if I got pulled over in Maine or uh, or New Hampshire or Vermont. Mm-hmm. But uh, Massachusetts, I, I I keep my carry permit in my wallet when I uh, when I hand over my license. Uh, they don't they if if I by chance I get asked to to step out of the car, then I will before I step out I will say that uh, I have a license to carry and I am currently exercising that license. How would you like to proceed? Mm-hmm. Again, never using the word gun whatsoever. Just license to carry, and I'm exercising that license. <laughs> exercising the license yeah okay whatever i think it works out <laughs> i just have this mental image of your little license with this little arms you know benching iron eh, eh, eh. it's badass at planking it's <laughs> <laughs> the daddiest of dad jokes <laughs> <sighs> apologize apologies aaron i hope you don't suffer any toxic effects you're not sorry don't, don't even try uh i'm not <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, shifting gears from uh, from from carrying guns to uh, some prepper adjacent things. Xander has been working like a dog with the crop harvest on his farm, and field work calls for field rations. And thoughts on MREs. <laughs> Welcome to Independent Thoughts with yours truly, Xander Opal. My apologies for the audio quality on this, as I'm still very busy with the end of corn harvest season, and I'm recording this in the field. Speaking of being busy, I've been actually going through, uh, once again, a bunch of MREs for lunches and dinners. One package for me is usually two meals. Uh, That also keeps me from... Uh, over consuming calories because those things are packed with calories. Now, I was a bit between more modern boxes of the stuff made this century, uh, so 
I uh, dipped into one of several that David gifted me when I visited him. It was a trip to Florida before a uh, couple weeks before before the gun blog shoot. So, um, yeah, the I those uh, were probably made uh, several decades ago, I suspect. And the one I had was edible. Obviously, I survived. Uh, however, the flavor wasn't the best. I don't know if preservatives have improved since then, or it's a result of uh, uh, just simply the stuff being real old. Uh, no uh, worries about hospital stays or anything like that. However, uh, I uh, do not intend to uh, represent the worst side of... Uh, that uh, Steve R MRE guy on YouTube. Uh, so uh, this basically means uh, d you need to r rotate through your food stocks uh, that you save for emergencies and uh, make sure that uh, they are still good because it's one thing to uh, buy food and set aside for later. It's another thing to throw food away that you spent a bit of extra money on because these preserved meals are not exactly cheap, uh, even by the unit. Uh, sure, uh, I can easily uh, double the price at one meal at a fast food place, but that's really not saying much. So, uh, enjoy this uh, a little bit of... Uh, uh, last minute contribution. I uh, hope you have an amazing day as uh, I am today harvesting corn and uh, have fun, uh, be safe, and I hope it gave you something to think about. Yeah, they can get old and not just age out, but I don't know how our soldiers and marines and anyone else who eats an MRE does it because okay I can eat one but if I had to eat another one that day it's just uh, can you just like beat me with a hose instead <laughs> even if it was a different menu yeah there's just something about the consistency of a typical MRE now I haven't eaten one super recently so maybe it's changed, but it's just, it's brickish, and there, there's a lot of preservatives and a lot of salt, and uh, I understand why they do it, but it just, it, it doesn't do a good taste. Now, like for over a year now, I've, I've been meaning to write a prepping article uh, about first strike rations. I, I did a presentation on prepping last year at Liberty Con, and, and I mentioned them and I had one and I've I've said in passing it was like one of the best military meals I've ever had because it tasted better than an MRE it tasted like low level fast food maybe like school cafeteria level and it was you know for for something that's designed to last for a long time it was surprisingly good so hopefully I can get over whatever's keeping me from doing my writing and I can talk about those uh First strike rations. The reason they're called that is because um, they are what you give troops just as they're about to enter battle because MREs are bulky. And when we were handed them, when I was in ROTC, the first thing you do is you strip them down. You know, you, you, you cut them out of the, uh, the thick plastic sack and you start breaking things down and throwing away the stuff you don't like. And, you know, that's, that's one meal that's about the size of of a dictionary a first strike ration is about the size of a football and it contains an entire day's worth of meals and it's all like finger food so you could eat it like on the march or whatever it doesn't last decades like an mre does but it lasts a decent amount of time it's light it's portable it tastes good so as far as i'm concerned first strike rations are so much better um, and, and I, I'm, I'm going to try <laughs> and if I can't do it, maybe I can get, um, 
my my retired yeah that's a thought my retired infantry officer who who's writing for blue car prepping now maybe he can talk about it but uh yeah they're 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 so much better because i i would choose to eat a first strike ration for me an mre is just like well it's better than starving well i mean that's also a really good idea because i well one of the things you always hear, I'm sure you've heard it a million times because you're way more into prepping than me, is the, oh, get yourself a 55-pound sack of, uh, of rice and a 55-pound sack of, uh, of, of dried beans. And the, mm-hmm. they last for ages, and it's a very, very nutritionally complete meal overall uh, and all that, and you could go through with it. And it's one of those, like, actually, I had, I had rice and beans for breakfast. I, uh, I, 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 I was thinking about when, uh, when I went to Costa Rica and every, you know, pretty much almost every meal, they would have this black beans and rice, uh, dish they would sell. It turns out it's called, uh, uh Gallo Pinto, which actually means spotted rooster. It's hilarious. Um, and, uh, and all that. And I ended up finding a, a recipe for it and, uh, I've modified it to, to my liking. And it's really, uh, I decided to I heated up a bowl that I had made, uh, made, made the other day for breakfast this morning. I'm like, Oh, this is so good. But meal fatigue can be a real thing. Even a really, really good Gallo Pinto may just get real, uh, it gets real old fast, but to have MREs to swap in between a, you know, shelf stable ish or easy to prepare meal that might work in a time when, you know, foods, foods, foods hard to come by, we, we power is out or anything like that. Uh, it'll, it'll help you with uh, meal fatigue because it'll add some variety. And you mentioned first strike. So one of the key things you want to do since this stuff does age out, even if it's like, the really, really, you know, the really long shelf life MREs, it means that you got to do something with them. You could either do the thing where, oh, when they expire, you throw them away and buy new. That's really expensive and kind of a waste. Or you could at least, you know, reclaim some of that money by eating the MREs, you know, in the case of Xander while, you know, while he's out in the field working as a way to get, uh, get some quick, uh, some quick calories in, or you could just have it set up as a weeknight meal, a sack lunch, that sort of thing, just to make yourself prepared to preparing it and figure out what you like. And, you know, God forbid you open one and you're like, Oh, this is nasty. I never want to eat this ever again. Well, then you probably shouldn't be stocking that. Mm hmm. The very first MRE I had was in 1991, and so I don't know how old this was, because I am sure that they had given it to my ROTC unit um, as a way of disposing of it. You know, we, we've had it in storage for our soldiers, and they haven't eaten it, so we, we're giving it to you so we, you don't have to throw it out. And your dad had and personally refused was... that meal in Vietnam. <laughs> They didn't have MREs in Vietnam. They had sea rations. Anyway, um, so the the entree, quote unquote, was a dehydrated, perhaps even a freeze dried pork patty, and that was bad enough. But to me, the insult on top of the injury was when they gave us ketchup. We didn't have a ketchup packet. We had a little container of. You know how you get you get the little containers of salt, which is like you know two little tubes yep. on a blister. They gave us dehydrated ketchup, Ooh. and it's just you bleep bleep. Why? Why did you do that? You know, with all the chemicals in ketchup, you're telling me that this this won't last for a decade. You have to dehydrate the freaking ketchup, and that, well, yeah, it, it gave me a, a bad impression towards MRE in general, and uh, future experiences have borne that out. <laughs> They've gotten better since then, I have to admit, but that was still, why? Oh, man, that that sounds awful. <laughs> it was. It was so awful. Also, I mean, what, what, what does they expect you to do? Are you supposed to sprinkle the ketchup powder onto it and splash a little bit more water, or, or when you're rehydrating the, the you're rehydrating the ketchup with the with the meat, or is there like a little like bowl or container or something that you can add water to? Like, how do you reconstitute the ketchup so you can actually use it? So, 
what you're supposed to do in this instance is use your canteen and canteen cup. And the canteen cup is metal that your canteen slips into, so it takes up not a lot of space. And so you would pour water into your canteen cup, and you would soak the pork patty in it in order to rehydrate it. And then, I don't know, I, I guess once it res uh, acquired the required uh, consistency, you take it out, and, and the residual moisture, you could then sprinkle the ketchup onto it like salt, and then it would rehydrate and be ketchupy. The thing is, since we were ROTC students, we were not issued canteens or canteen cups. Not, not at that point in time. You know, we were just drinking from the cardboard Dixie cups and a big old cooler. And so it was just like, so either you can try to rehydrate it by shoving it into this small cup, or you can just go, well, I'm, I'm going to be manly and just crunch into it. <laughs> just astronaut ice cream. It. Yes, basically, yes. It, it it was like astronaut ice cream, but pork flavored and uh, a different texture because as opposed to, you know, dairy product, this was meat. And so it was just, oh, wow, what an interesting flavor we've discovered. <laughs> it's It's stringy. Somewhat pork flavored styrofoam. Yum. The horror. The horror. <laughs> uh, Speaking of horrors, Aaron. Oh, right. Canada's up to some garbage and Weird's gonna fisk it. So I dislike it when other nations talk about our gun policies. So it would be rude for me to talk about the gun policies of other nations. That being said, it's perfectly fine to look and see what other nations have done and how it worked out, especially if there's a parallel to policies here. The nation in question today is our brothers to the north, Canada. Violent gun crime is on the rise across Canada with big cities in the line of fire. Canada's largest police union says there's been a 45% increase in shootings and 62% spike in gun-related homicides in Toronto compared to this time last year. Yikes! I thought Canada had strict gun control and therefore would have low gun violence, especially for a high-income nation not at war, as the anti-gunners always say. Two years ago this week, the Canadian government put a freeze on the sale of handguns. It is no longer legal to buy, sell, or transfer a handgun in Canada. Yep, been two years since the handgun ban. I think you can see how it's going. In recognition of the ban's anniversary, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau shared this message on X, saying in part, we choose your safety over the gun lobby every time. We choose your safety over the gun lobby? Is that kind of like common sense gun control? And is this kind of like my last fisk, where the tactic was lie and hope nobody checks? That prompted the Toronto Police Association to respond to Trudeau saying, your statement is out of touch and offensive to victims of crime and police officers everywhere. Whatever you think you've done to improve community safety has not worked. Who do you trust more when it comes to reporting on crime and crime statistics? A career legacy politician like Justin Trudeau or the Toronto police chief? A pretty bold statement. Yeah, absolutely. I think our members are absolutely fed up with the Prime Minister. To be honest, it's lip service. He knows that it doesn't impact the crime in this city. Police need to deal with the aftermath of violent crime every day. And think about it constantly when conducting calls and traffic stops. And they know that criminals just don't follow the law. When asked if the Toronto Police Association supports Canada's handgun ban, their president answered point blank, no. Pretty definitive. And to think, Kamala Harris supported a total handgun ban in San Francisco, as well as urged the courts to rule against individual rights in Heller versus D.C. I know Kamala Harris lost, but these ideas are neither unique nor rare, so be mindful of politicians and the promises they bring. Those are your anti-gun talking points and a few rebuttals to combat them. Aaron, were you surprised that gun control doesn't work? Why, yes, weird. I was totally taken by surprise. 
<laughs> yeah, it was a short, it was it was a short fisk, but I I couldn't resist on that. It, it it ties in with the the New York story at the beginning. Is the yeah, you uh you, you ban things and it and it doesn't work. And I mean, in this case, you ban the guns and oh, the shootings actually go up. And that actually happened in England after their after their ban. There was a lot of talk of the stabbing, and there is a lot of stabbing issues, but actually the uh, the shootings actually went up in in uh, in England after their handgun ban um and there is if you look at the data it actually just went up a little bit and then it went way way down and then it turned out the home office was reporting the stats wrong and then it went way back up again huh go figure yeah i i recall that from however many years ago uh the home office was cooking the books because they would only report it as, like, say, a gun murder if they could conclusively prove that this person used this weapon to kill this other person. And if any part of it was unresolved, it's a mystery, and it wasn't entered as, you know, a, a gun homicide. And and I remember that being a big scandal some 10, 15 years ago. They also had it on the, if a, if if the same person called multiple times, like, or it's... I think it's nine nine nine. I forget what their uh, what their nine one yep. is. No, that that's correct. Nine nine nine. So, but if 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 a if if they got multiple nine 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 calls from the same number, they would only count one of them. Mm. So, like, if you li- happen to live in a really bad area, or next door neighbor to to gang members and drug dealers or something like that, and they're particularly violent, well, the first time they stab somebody and they were they're they're on your stoop. That one will get counted, but all the others. Oh no, no, no! That's the same call. It it produced very, very uh, the appearances of a lot of safety. I, I I have failed as a geek. Um, what what I actually should have done was sing song that bit from the IT crowd where they introduced the new emergency number, and I don't remember it anymore. But instead of nine nine nine, it's oh one one eight nine 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 eight eight one nine nine nine. One one nine seven two five. Long pause. Three. Uh, yeah, I butchered it because I don't remember the tune. I'm sorry. Well, that's easy to remember. O one one eight nine 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 eight eight one nine 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 one one nine seven two five three. <laughs> but but you know but, but you know who remembers the tune. If our listeners remember the tune, I will be impressed. Good for them. <laughs> I'm putting it on you guys. There's, there'll be a test at the end. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to thank each and every one of you. But a very special thanks to all our supporters on Patreon. So you're a Patreon patron, go to patreon.com slash so Calibers Podcast to sign up. Patrons get an early release of the podcast, plus bonus content like hilarious blooper reels, the ACB film tracks, and the AC Mag Dump. <laughs> oh, are we speed running this now? <laughs> I, do your part. Also, Aaron. please remember to rate us on Apple Podcasts and Pocket Cast. Subscribe to us on the platform of your choice and share the show with your friends, both online and off. I have a blog. It's called weirdworld.com. That's W E E R D world.com. <laughs> you can hear me weekly on Handgun Radio on the Firearms Radio Network. And you can get more from me at linktree slash Aaron Paulette. That's linktree.e forward slash Aaron Paulette. All one word. And thanks to Nate Spencer for our music. So, yeah, I, I don't update my blog nearly as often as I used to, and, and I don't like it, and I own it. But, I mean, at least my blog is more than a repository for my podcast, Weirdington Elizabeth Beard. Um, but, hey, a- at least you do something. Unlike Oddball, I don't remember the last time Gun Cars Tech updated anything. Uh... Yeah, I'm I'm throwing shade. I'm snarky. Um, our, our level of blog accountability is assorted, and so is our podcast. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>